like we're on the cloud. All right. So welcome everyone uh, to this month's fireside chat um, hosted by the Turning Way and Open Hardware Makers. Um, we're really excited to have uh, folks here. Uh, I'm Anne-Lee Steele. I'm the community manager of the Turing Way, and I'm a part of and support an organizing team and a community of folks to steward contributions to the book um, and to our community-led guides and many other projects besides. Um, but to get us started, in case you don't know about the Turing Way, is an open source, open collaboration and a community developed handbook on data science. And our goal is to make reproducible, ethical and collaborative data science accessible and comprehensible for everyone. And um, myself and many others in the community, we aim to represent an international community of researchers and practitioners to create resources as chapters and community building practices that bring in perspectives from countries, from backgrounds, from cultures, and from all sorts of different experiences, which is really at the core of the project. Um, and this Fireside Chat series has really been an effort to create a space where people could gather and exchange concerns, explore challenges, share different practices and ideas uh, that work across their different contexts. Um, and we will, just to let you know a little bit more about the format, we will be hosting um, an hour long conversation together today. Um, and then we'll be leaving open this room for around 30 minutes after our call, in case you have any questions or conversations or things you'd like to bring to the fore um, and would like to connect with our speakers in another format. That call, however, won't be recorded. So in the context of this fireside chat, um, this topic of connecting open hardware to open science really emerged out of conversations with Julia Tarantillo, who will be introducing herself in a mo moment. Um, really delighted to have co-developed and be co-hosting this conversation with her today, um, which really came out of a kind of a sense of perception of a divide between the world of open hardware and the world of open science more broadly. In many ways, both, of course, um, being connected to the open source software movement, but have somehow found divergences and applications and, and different problems, right, that, that have come from their respective applications or, or spaces in which they find themselves. Um, and as someone who is has myself, you know, studied both online communities and in real life processes in the form of supply chains, is really keen to be able to speak with you all today about um, what it means to kind of connect these, these different spaces and also to connect those conversations back into the world of open science in which the Turing Way finds itself. Um, but I won't go too much into that. Uh, I'll leave that's more, leave more for our conversation together. Um, just a couple of logistics and short notes. Uh, please note, as you know from the chat, uh, we do have a shared etherpad to facilitate written note taking and I'd be, invite ideas from you all who have joined in to listen uh, today. We also have a code of conduct that applies to this event to ensure accessibility and respectful collaboration and really for any concerns reporting an incident that makes you feel uncomfortable or for further ideas to improve our accessibility as a project, please, please email theturningway at gmail.com or alternatively, you can reach out to me as a COC facilitator um, by emailing me, um, sending me a message on Slack um, or other through my other contact information, which is in the etherpad. And so with that, I'm really delighted to hand it over to Hu Li um, to kick off today's uh, session by introducing herself, um, a little bit more about her experience, a little bit more about open hardware makers, and then we'll pass it on to our speakers. Thank you, and, and hi everyone. I'm, I'm really happy to see so many people here in, in this uh, Zoom today. Uh, thank you, first of all, Anne and the Turing Way for the space. As you were mentioning, um, we're trying to bridge open hardware and open science, so this, this spaces are incredibly important. I'm very thankful for that. Um, about me, I, I have many hats, but I'm uh, currently a postdoctoral researcher associated to Drexel University in, in the US. And I am making a case study of open flexure, which is a, an open hardware microscope. Uh, if you want to learn more about that, you can go to openflexure.org. Um, and I'm heavily involved with uh, open hardware communities in science. So one of the, um, I think the hat I'm here with today is uh, I'm one of, one of the co-founders with Alexander Fuschera and uh, Andre Chagas of the mentoring program, Open Hardware Makers. Uh, this is an online initiative to uh, train, mentor people, developers in academia and outside academia in which are the best practices for sharing their open hardware projects. And just to uh, kick off the, the introductory question today, the opening question today, 
which is why, how did I get into open hardware? Why are we here? Um, I will start by saying that for me, um, open hardware is an opportunity for democratizing, especially in science, uh, knowledge and access to technology. Uh, I've been, I just come back from the Latin America gathering of open science hardware and it was an incredible experience where small, very small farmers are getting to use data science by applying open hardware practices. So it's amazing. The potential is amazing. And I would like to invite our invited speakers to also uh, reply to this question. Um, why, what is open hardware for you and why, um, why is it important for you? How did you arrive to this space? Why do you think we should be all doing more open hardware? Maybe we can start with Frank. Do you want to join us? Welcome. Introduce yourself. Hello, everyone. My name is Frank, Frank Landon Bensum. I am the executive manager for Africa Open Science Hardware, Africa Ash, um, a community of um, makers, maker spaces, scientists, technologists, hackers, uh, policymakers, all open science enthusiasts. And uh, we are dedicated to making open science hardware ubiquitous by 2025, and also promoting innovation and science and research in Africa. We want to give makers, African makers, the platform to showcase their uh, their innovations. Um, so, how did I get into open hardware? Okay, um, back when I was a kid. Um, I used to spend my summer holidays with my my grandparents in the village, and my granddad, um, he rest in peace. Uh, he he owned this really large cocoa field, so during the summer holidays we just go to the cocoa fields, and me and the kids would play. And every now and then I got I got bruises, spines, I got injured, and I'd come home, and my grandma would be would tell me, go around back and go pick out some leaves and bring it and she'll mix it up and she'll apply it on the affected area. And um, in a matter of days, I'd start to feel better. And um, on days that I can't find the leaves, would go to a neighbor's house to ask for the leaves if they do have some. And uh, it was that culture that uh, I realized that knowledge, that kind of knowledge, it was transmitted from generation to generation and it was universal knowledge. Everybody in the village knew how to, how to cure a sickness and what to use or where to find them. Um, over the past few decades, I've realized that that culture of sharing knowledge has, uh, has died out a bit, which is unfortunate. So to me, I think um, open hardware is, is a sort of bringing back that culture to, to share knowledge, to make knowledge accessible to everyone. So we could just improve our lives and help solve local problems. That was really, really inspiring. I, I fully agree with you, Frank. Thank you so much for introducing yourself and sharing your story. Um, Carrie Ann, would you like to join us introducing yourself and telling what brought you into open hardware? Yeah, sure. Um, I hope I can be heard okay. Um, I'm Carrie Ann Harrington. Um, my expertise is actually in optical fibers, um, but I got into uh, open hardware um, through Richard Bowman, who uh, works on the Open Fletcher project. So they're most known for their Open Fletcher microscope, um, but that's not all they do. So um, I helped with um, some of the uh, Open Fletcher applications when applied to a block stage, which is often used for launching into optical fibers. Um, and um, I basically thought it was really cool that um, anyone uh, could go and download the microscope and then build it for themselves. So if you've ever worked in an experimental lab as a postdoc, you'll see there's a lot of reinventing the wheel. Um, and so I, I'm really excited about open uh, hardware and open science because I think it's got the potential to um, make science more reproducible and save a lot of time as well. So um, yeah, uh, that's where my interest lies. Thanks, Karian. Thank um, you. It's great seeing you here. We are often at the University of Bath, so <laughs> we can bump into each other. Um, okay, I will continue with Sally. If you can unmute yourself. Sure. Uh, thanks, Julie. Uh, I'm Sally Faz. I'm a professor at Utrecht University. Uh, 
my main research is about actually microscopy uh, and I actually built microscopes, optical microscopes. Uh, a colleague uh, once asked me, when are you the happiest uh, at work? And I said, when I have a screwdriver in my hand. And that's uh, really true. But since about five, six years ago, I got involved in the open science uh, initiatives of my university, Utrecht University, because we would like to do some advocacy to bring it to the culture of the uh, scientists. So we wrote a plan, uh, I made podcasts, uh, we had a couple of different activities and it has become in the Netherlands now quite a national uh, program uh, uh, which has its own funding system, etc. But then as I saw that it has its own momentum, I sort of took a step back and about two years ago, we, with a couple of colleagues uh, at different universities, we started the FAIR battery project, and that's the project which aims at making a fully open source battery with locally resourced materials and uh, expertise. And we have been busy with this for quite a while. I, I feel now back at home, combining uh, open science, or in this case, open hardware, and my sort of engineering capabilities, although it's not my main research area, but I feel like I must do it. and. If you know open access publishing is complicated, uh, yeah, I, I invite you to see the complexity of uh, talking about open hardware uh, with uh, with companies. Uh, uh, yeah, that's my uh, current state of engaging with uh, with uh, open hardware. Thank you, Sandy. We will be talking about those complexities during the talk today. So I hope. Um, Sarah, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure, thank you. Hello, I'm Sarah Hutton. Um, I am the incoming research and community engagement lead for the Internet of Production Alliance. Um, and I'm also a, a research associate um, for the Center of Student Success Research and Public Interest Technology programs at the University of Massachusetts Amherst. Um, I have, I think, probably a little bit different of a background in coming to this. Um, I have been an academic research librarian for over 20 years um, with a focus on open, um, open software development, open educational resources, um, open governance, open data sets. And uh, most recently, having been at UMass Amherst, uh, which is a Carnegie R1 high research production institution, I've spent, um, you know, well over a decade working with researchers in, you know, conducting the research to, um, you know, have uh, produced vaccines to, to come up with, with different types of hardware and whatnot, and, you know, have examples of that as well. But most recently served as the, the Dean of Libraries at the, the university and really, you know, have seen firsthand in my experience at every different level in the system, um, also being a, a educational policy researcher about the, um, you know, really the hurdles in accessing information and just to reiterate um, and echo what the other panelists have already mentioned, um, you know, there's such great opportunity to accelerate the research process by opening up the data by allowing um, you know, the opening up of the, the participation in knowledge production and scholarship. That's been something that has been, a, you know, I've been deeply steeped in for a very long time. And in my experience as you know, a faculty member and researcher, um, I've put together programs with uh, different um, you know, ministries of education for visiting scholars on conducting research um, you know, looking at what are some of the problems that you're experiencing in your home communities and how can you build a solution to solve that problem, whether it's drought, desalination of water in desert areas, um, you know, insect infestation and whatnot. And so on every level of seeing how open can really help. The reason why I, I have come to um, open hardware specifically, I feel like it's a culmination of all of my um, experiences and, and interests. Um, but really, you know, going back to, to thinking about it from the perspective of where I really, really started, um, which was growing up on a farm in uh, rural Maine in the poorest county, Piscataquis County, entirely landlocked, um, you know, a crumbling economy. This was pre-internet. A lot of the spaces there still don't have access to the internet um, or electricity in, in many senses. And so, you know, I grew up, um, in a, in a situation where there wasn't access to a lot of resources 
and we built a lot of our own things. Like I learned how to uh, gut a room and put up sheetrock as a kid. I've replaced exhaust systems and CV joint boots in cars and was always looking for solutions um, to be able to solve the problem because we didn't have enough and looked at like, how can you swap out like this aluminum sheeting for welding, even though we know it's gonna break eventually, like how do you just get by? And I see that problem now where people don't have access to the machinery, the information, the electricity to solve problems. And I want to contribute to developing infrastructure, um, you know, data standards and relationships to support solving problems in communities. Cause I'm, I know what that's like. <laughs> Uh, thank you, Sarah. That's a, another very, very interesting story. And um, I will, I think we will learn uh, along the conversation all this kind of different angles to open hardware access, efficiency, and collaboration. Um, I will now pass the mic to Anne, who will uh, start with the first question for our panel. Thanks, Uli, and thanks so much, everyone, for your introductions. There's so much to draw upon, everything from the process of sharing knowledge to make it accessible for everyone, from its use in research environments and optical fibers, in creation of batteries, of microscopes, of open governance and open data sets, access to in physical infrastructures that affect all of our lives. There's so many different elements here that um, as someone who had not used open hardware or had, had in many ways looked at the open hardware movement from the outside, it seems to connect so many different threads together from so many other fields at the same time. And so, you know, when we came together to, to think through open hardware, we realized that it was in many ways kind of like the, the wider uh, open umbrella or open science umbrella that's commonly an image used and associated with open science, open science being, you know, a, a large umbrella that encompasses many other processes. Open hardware similarly seems to occupy and encompass many other um, fields, you know, the other aspects of not only scientific research, but um, many other fields more broadly. And so in an effort to pin it down um, and also maybe to draw it to, to something that really made open hardware much more visible within our societies more broadly, it was the COVID-19 pandemic and the initial lockdowns. Um, so really the first question that we wanted to ask was that, you know, because the COVID-19 pandemic has allowed open hardware to, to showcase in many ways its, its full potential and its, its way of ways of working, um, we wanted to ask you all, you know, what are the opportunities, the challenges that arose from open hardware during the pandemic? What were your own experiences um, with your own projects and otherwise? Um, that were affected by the COVID-19 pandemic. And maybe um, I'll actually toss this one to Carrie Ann first, because during one of the speaker check-ins, she shared this amazing story about um, a project that she was engaged in in the first months of the lockdowns. Uh, <laughs> yeah, so um, when uh, the lockdown happened in March 2020, uh, our lab um, that I work in for optical fibers shut down. So it shut down for three months. Um, and um, I was also part of the local uh, maker space in Southampton uh, called So Make It. And they were looking for people who had some CAD, some, uh, some CAD knowledge and some 3D printing knowledge to help print some uh, PPE. So the face visors um, that were going around. So this was a design that was shared through the, I think originally the Prusa community. Um, and uh, basically the Ed Cheney, who's part of the makers space, he had connections with uh, care, people who worked in care homes and people who worked in hospitals oh, yeah. who needed this, this PPE, they couldn't get hold of it. Um, and so um, we downloaded the design, uh, we built a print farm, we got hold of the materials. Um, and before we started doing this, the university hadn't really like interacted with, um, uh, with the makerspace at all, but you know, the university were really glad to give us their printers because they were currently not being used at all. Um, and so we were able to build this like print farm uh, in a matter of days. Um, and there was only like two or three of us. Um, and we were able to get to the point where we were printing thousands of masks a week and also delivering them to the people that needed them. Um, so for me, it was a really 
good opportunity to uh, collaborate with the local community um, and make loads of connections um, to be able to help people really directly. We were able to get feedback. So um, one of the surgeons who was collecting the mask were like, you know, it's a little bit rough. Um, so can you fix that? And we like, you know, we would take their input and change the design um, so that it benefited them more directly. Uh, so yeah, it was really, I felt at that time it was really supported. Um, and then uh, after the masks were no longer needed, the face visors were no longer needed. It was a bit of a shame because the collaboration kind of died. Like we delivered the printers that were donated back um, and it would have been really cool if this was a collaboration that like, continued. Um, so yeah, that, that's my experience so far. That was that was really really interesting to see how how labs can yeah can re be recycled and, and do something else. Um, for this as this question is kind of an introductory question to showcase the impact, and then we will move on to to questions where we have more time to um, yeah time everyone chime in. Uh, I would like Frank if you could mention uh, from your experience from Africa, which was the the opportunities and challenges for the for open hardware during the pandemic and and then we will move on to another question where, where everyone can join in and we'll start more of a conversation if that's all right uh, thank you so when the COVID-19 pandemic hit down uh, schools closed down there was lockdown uh, churches everywhere was closed down and there was this mass panic buy of uh, face shields and face masks and uh, sanitizers, protective gears. It became really scarce. And the ones that you could find on the market shot up like five times the price, the uh, initial price. So it became very, very expensive to buy hand sanitizers or nose, nose masks. So the interesting thing is makers from different regions of Africa came together to develop and build and 3D print respirators and uh, ventilators, face masks, face shields, and even hand sanitizers. The interesting thing is uh, most of these, um, these were built using local materials and uh, recycled plastics. So it was an opportunity that came out of the uh, pandemic because it, it brought back the conversation of using local materials to, to manufacture in Africa. And uh, the COVID-19 pandemic was, although unfortunate, but uh, it brought, brought back the conversation about the importance of using local materials. And it was amazing how the maker movement came together to help uh, the various communities fight against uh, the COVID virus. Uh, there were uh, maker spaces, uh, 3D printing, Nose, nose masks and uh, respirators and face shields and donating to schools, churches, local hospitals. And it was, it was great using uh, recycled plastics to, uh, to make face shields. It was, it was, it was amazing. It was, it was something to behold. So I think uh, for Africans, we realized that uh, we couldn't, we can't always rely on important materials for manufacturing and for producing our goods. And uh, when COVID restricted uh, that, we had to sort of rely on our own resources and we had to find ways to, to, to survive, to, to help our community. So yeah, that, that, that's what the COVID um, pandemic brought to Africa. It, it helped Africans know that we can manufacture things on our own using local materials and recycled plastics. It's been an amazing, um, an amazing effort and hopefully one that can be built off of. And I'm sorry, Julian Advance, but I saw Sunny's hand uh, raised for a second there. So I'll pass the mic to him before you move on to the second question. Yeah, thank you very much. I just want to briefly mention on top of all the grassroots initiatives, which were fantastic. I think for the open hardware community, the story of open drones and the pandemic and how they saved uh, actually New York uh, will remain. Uh, it also proves that, you know, you can have a open source based business model and sort of drive, become a, even a unicorn uh, 
and I think people have to really study that and I think it will stay and it will be a very big shift in, in how we treat uh, open hardware. Thank you, Stanley. I just shared the link to the initiative you were mentioning, which is Open Fronts, which is kind of a paradigmatic case for anyone who is interested in open hardware through science. Um, and I would like to move on to our second question, which is more about the practical challenges for open hardware and how it works. So we are kind of um, right now at this point, after all the work, amazing work of the open science movement, we are more familiar with open data, open access to publications, uh, open educational resources, but open hardware has some differences and we have to deal, for example, with supply chains and, and as Frank was mentioning, well, local materials and how do you document and share, which is the source code of open hardware, right? So it's, it's kind of a different complexity. And I would like to ask our panelists, what do you think is the most relevant challenges in your work for bringing more people into open hardware and for bridging open hardware and open science? Um, anyone can start and we can, in this section, please, you're welcome to open your mic and start replying to each other if you like it. Maybe Sarah, you, you haven't replied to the first question if you want to start. Sure, sure. Um, I think that one of the, you know, one of the biggest challenges that we face um, is looking at um, you know a shared vocabulary or ontologies between groups um, and understanding you know what what kind of standard are we looking at here? I mean, we talk about metadata standards a lot for data interoperability and portability, but there isn't really anything for hardware yet. Um, it's it's developing. It's developing currently, and in the conversations that I've had um, with uh, Internet of Production Alliance community members, you know from organizations, uh, multiple organizations that are, are looking into this, um, you know, there, there are discussions about what kind of standard are we looking at using here? And it's about building one. And some of the work that, um, you know, that has already been done in the, the open know-how standard, as well as, you know, open nowhere for mapping out an ecosystem of available hardware and resources for the reproducibility of items. You know, it's a, it's, awareness, um, its involvement, and coming to an agreement about, you know, what what is it that we're really trying to, to map out here and solve? And, um, you know, some of the, the work that we've doing, been doing, for example, in um, with uh, the Next Generation Internet um, and data portability um, for being able to move some data between platforms. Um, the tooling it hasn't been developed. Um, and so that's really the work that's happening right now. And um, and I think that that's, again, you know, it's a lot doesn't exist yet and a lot takes, I think there are, in working with a lot of software engineers over, over the years um, and having worked in open governance and establishing metadata standards, it's a lot more than just developing the tooling. It's coming to a shared consensus about what the tooling is trying to accomplish. And I think that that's one of the biggest challenges. <laughs> I completely agree uh, from my own experience doing research on, on open hardware for science. And uh, before moving on to um, whoever wants to go next to talk about challenges for open hardware, also thinking about the promise of distributed manufacturing, right? The fact that we could share a design and someone somewhere else could download that design and just rebuild it. So thinking of all this um, super interesting potential, and we saw some of that during the COVID-19 pandemic, um, which are, for example, uh, Sally, do you want to share some of the challenges that you think are most relevant today? Uh, about recipes. No, I meant, sorry, I meant the challenges for open hardware to become widely adopted or yeah. for it to become closer to open science. Yeah, so um, I want to here mention that, you know, we had in the in the topic of open access publishing, we had this issue of, you know, the PDF and how can we actually make it. And there at least it is, was very common for, you know, 400 years for people to write down their results in a way that they can publish and now it became cheaper and cheaper to copy that. In open hardware, the extra challenge is that actually writing how you do things is not even so common. 
So try any any paper and then get a method section and try to reproduce it. 99% uh, you fail, and there are many examples that show this. So we have, we have to start one step back and actually teach to our researchers or inventors documentation of uh, an importance of documentation of how they do things properly that it becomes reproduced. And this is one challenge further than uh, you know making what they have done actually openly accessible to all. On the other hand, also it avoids a lot of waste. So I think there's a lot of benefits on doing that, even inside a lab or even inside one person's, you know, four years of PhD. So there's also a lot of gain to be made uh, because it's so primitive to document how you do things. I think that would be my, my, where I put my most focus if I want to sort of work uh, on open hardware in my teaching, in my classes would be on documentation. Thanks, Stanley. Yeah, indeed. Everyone, everyone is worried about how how do we document all this work? How do we make sure that someone else can can reproduce it? Um, I don't see. Frank. Oh, yeah. Uh, Carrie Ann, do you want to continue, and then we go to Frank? And remember, you can just open your mic and reply to each other. Uh, yeah, I guess for my challenge, uh, the biggest challenge is uh, working in a university. Um, as a postdoc is the time. So uh, you get heavily uh, judged on your publication output. So any time that's you know not leading to a direct publication or something that the university straightforwardly recognizes as an output is a, is a risk. So even though um, open science and open hardware is something that like publication teams at universities will recognize and will be very excited about, it's not something that uh, in the sort of department sort of uh, uh, part will be openly understood or recognized as well as uh, either getting a patent or um, making a publication. So um, I, I completely agree that a lot of the time if you try and uh, reproduce something from a, a lab in another university, it's actually really hard because there'll be like small little things about the equipment or the uh, experimental setup that um, you you just can't know and won't be described in the paper. Um, a lot of the time you have to go away and like actually see the lab to actually fully understand what's going on. Um, and so uh, the capabilities become very unique to the to the areas. So um, I think that universities are uh, excited about like buzzwords, but they don't always like fully understand it enough to support you being able to actually do it. So um, it would be uh, a lot of high risk time for me to use to really pursue something. Whereas if I was just a patent something, um, it would be something that my project would reward and my university would straightforwardly acknowledge as an output. Um, that they could put on, you know, some sort of report like a ref. Um, Sarah, you have a comment to carry on. Yeah, just a very quick comment um, to that. Um, absolutely. <laughs> absolutely. And 100% um, at research institutions, it's about, you know, technology transfer. And what are, you know, what are your um, you know, your your impact factors, what's your age index and whatnot. And a lot of what you're producing is bound up in, um, you know, the tenure promotion process and how you are, um, you know, judged for your output. And it is um, a system of, you know, uh, knowledge commodification, information commodification, and a lot of this stuff continues to be locked down. And and while it's, you know, we're talking about research institutions and academia versus, you know, like. <laughs> the real world and people actually doing things. It's a lot of these institutions are the intellectual and economic drivers for, um, you know, the, the creation of, you know, a lot of life-saving vaccines and techniques and, and whatnot. And they are the ones that are still putting, um, you know, IP and copyrights and patenting and trademarking these things that then make them prohibitive for access. Um, just you know, for a quick example, looking at ISO standards, those cost hundreds of dollars to access. Um, and that would, you know, just to, to punctuate the comment, one of the other big challenges that, that I have seen um, is that when you're looking at standards, so far as you know, health and safety standards are concerned, or governmental regulations are concerned, 
they vary, um, you know, geographically, globally. And it is very challenging to come to a shared understanding of, you know, how you're going to be able to reproduce something, um, you know, as it should have been reproduced here, what's the fail rate, but also is it safe to use? And, um, and I don't think that, you know, these uh, academic institution research drivers are doing a good job at providing that information via documentation or legal support. Uh, um, Frank, what about um, from an African OSH perspective, what, what are the main challenges now for open hardware? Well, I'd like to uh, talk a little about what Sally said about documentation. I have come to find out that uh, most African makers don't, uh, we really have the necessary resources to document their, their hardware or how they make, how they create. So um, I've met a few who have YouTube channels who um, in the process of the video, the, uh, the process and they upload it on YouTube and most of them require high resolution cameras. So the results to and high resolution cameras are very expensive in Africa, most part of Africa at least. And um, so the results to using the iPhones, which are also quite expensive. So documentation, I also say is, uh, is a challenge. And, um, and there is electricity, there is uh, internet, but I would say education. There's not enough education in Africa about open science and open hardware. So there is, it is least practice in, compared to other continents. It's not enough education. I think there's a, there's a general misconception and mis misunderstanding on what open science and open hardware is. So that leads to less people uh, practicing uh, open science and open hardware. Thank you, Frank. And um, there is also just uh, just a comment um, for in general uh, hearing to all of you. I think hardware tends to be more invisible than as an infrastructure, right? Like when you go to the lab, the machines are there, but lab technicians are not as rewarded as academic personnel. And in general, we are, it's a given, like hardware is there or is not there, but it's not a problem that we have to open or not. We are most focused on the publications, on the outputs, on the data. And especially at research institutions, it's hard to make the point that opening the hardware is also relevant. Um, because it's, it's what allows you to produce all the rest of the, of the products. Um, does anyone want to make any quick comment before we move on to the, set, to the final question? Julia, I would be remiss if I didn't jump in here and talk a little bit more about documentation, um, mm -hmm. as it's so core to the history of the Turing Way as a project. Um, back in 2018, um, Dr. Christy Whitaker, um, gathered together a core group of her allies to create the book of reproducibility, which is the fir first book of the, of the Turing Way, the first guide, um, really out of, an, out of an effort to, to close this documentation gap for best practices, not meaning to set a singular standard, but rather to even have them within a single space. And then the four other guides that emerged outside of that were really, you know, realizing how much all of the other aspects of science um, required documentation in a similar vein in order to you know, make reproducibility too easy not to do, right? And funnily enough, um, the section that we have on open hardware was one of the first uh, things that I had read um, when I'd learned about the Turing Way as a project and also um, when I joined the project as, as community manager. And it was really, to me, um, I'd often found, and this kind of connects funnily enough to a uh, a conversation that was had in a previous fireside chat about open infrastructure, how questions of things like connectivity are often so separate from those of computation. In this case, how you know questions of open hardware and the support systems needed to require it can often be very separate from questions of um, support systems re required for open source software. And so I see challenges. Um, I think my, I, I go also back to the question of documentation and like how do you make that much easier to do and, and what um, spaces and processes make that easier to do. But also I'll add one other thing is that it seems like a lot of these questions are really tied to incentives uh, on different scales. Um, one being, you know, incentives on institutional levels, you know, tenure track jobs, um, et cetera. But then there's also incentives on the interpersonal uh, level. Karen, you talked about, um, you talked about access to time, which is so, can be very lab dependent 
that is also a structural question. And the question of education, Frank, that you'd mentioned, um, the questions of all tied up within, you know, the wider structures of inter intellectual property law that you'd mentioned, Sarah, and suddenly going back to documentation, it's kind of a, how can documentation then, with all of these things in mind that are both, you know, interpersonal and um, institutional problems, but also much tied to our lighter, wider economic context, um, can, in, can documentation be a tool to, to be able to connect between the larger scale and the smaller scale? Um, because oftentimes I feel like when I'm in conversations where we ask questions about what are the challenges in changing the culture of science, it ultimately ties back to these much larger structural issues. Um, yeah, just trying in there. Pass it back to you, Lily. Oh, that's super interesting. And in fact, yeah, it is this kind of combination of both, right? And how the, the incentives also influence the micro. And, uh, Sarah, you have a comment? So we want. Yeah, I do. Um, just speaking to that documentation piece and, um, you know, circling back to something that Frank was talking about with, um, you know, education and access, particularly in areas that are uh, low or no bandwidth um, and having access to information and being able to have that channel of communication open. Um, I wanted to use an example of one of the the projects that um, you know, I've worked on with, with UMass and also Shift IT and a couple of other partners, um, I'll just drop a, a link in chat here, um, just as an example um, where it's, you know, over, over the years, this is a, a, a peer to, it's a peer-to-peer -peer socioeconomic production model where it's basically just being able to provide you know, that documentation and that know-how to be able to produce um, items um, locally with local materials. Um, and it's a it's something that has worked very well over the years within these, you know, within this research community and these communications we use um, basically like a, you know, just a, a Twitter account for people to request information and we provide, you um, you know, open educational content, ensuring that the licensing is okay and everything. And um, there are data couriers um, in Malawi and, and, and Ghana that, you know, pick up the data and bring it to a classroom where there's a racial device that like distributes all of that. But the thing is, is that even though this is a, is a well-known workable system that's allowing this transfer of information to go back and forth to be able you know, to use, you know, recycled plastics and whatnot to build different devices. It is so, it has been incredibly challenging to get any um, funding and support from it from um, institutions because it's not recognized as, you know, it's, it, it goes back to that incentive, um, you know, conversation about like, why would you underwrite or support this? I mean, this is an incredible, very viable system. And it's just been fascinating to me over the years as, we, as we've approached funding, it's, you know, people don't really conceptually understand it very well. That, you know, that, that last mile of transfer, like to, to pay, for, pay for data transfer on handheld devices and compensate people for their time, the couriers that run things back and forth, it's not understood as being part of an economically viable system. And so I see this happening, you know, this is just one example, it, it happens all the time. Um, where it's just like funders can't wrap their minds around, institutions can't wrap their minds around it. Absolutely, and and I think you you made a very good point, and it it leads us directly to the third question. And I wanted here to to bring back something that Carrie Ann mentioned on how institutions, universities, are really attracted to open hardware once they they see the potential of impact it has. Right. I will mention two um, two very concrete cases. So I'm studying this microscope, and this microscope is being used in a in a hospital in Tanzania for setting up a local chain uh, supply chain of microscopes in order to diagnose malaria faster and in a more efficient way. If the microscope breaks down, then someone can repair it locally and they don't have to rely on a support technical support like overseas right that is prohibitively expensive and that that is kind of a, an impact story that is very appealing for university and on the other hand it also has it is more efficient for if, if you have a postdoc building a uh, building whatever device during the work you don't you can rely on that work being available for the future postdoc that comes after or, or for whoever comes into the into the lab next because you are not 
basically putting that in a drawer and just forgetting about it. And, and you have to restart all over again. And as carrie was mentioning, reverse engineering and wasting so much time. So it also accelerates collaboration in science. So if we have this clear example, and they repeat all over when you start learning about open hardware, we mentioned, Sarah, some of the reasons why they, we, we, it's still hard to get support. But I would like to ask a question to whoever wants to chime in. How can, how can institutions better support open hardware? What can we do about that? What can we ask institutions for? Feel free to unmute yourself. Hi, so um, I would say in African perspective, I would say funding. Funding plays a very important role in the open hardware practices. And I think if there is uh, enough funding made available, it would ease the practice of uh, open hardware in Africa. Yeah. Uh, if I may continue, I, I'm not sure. I mean, university would be the best place. The maker spaces were mentioned, but I think which one has to connect it to the uh, to the main activities at the university if you want to take it over. And many activities of university, at least in uh, research universities, is teaching still and education. So if if the connection is made with teaching, if the connection is made with the advantages with teaching, it's not that difficult. And I would say, I mean, it's not uh, only far places that need teaching. Uh, every even the places like MIT also need to educate people like about uh, about the value of uh, making things yourself and open hardware. But I would say it's also demands from the open hardware community to somehow a bit distance itself from the idealism. If I compare it with the uh, you know Linux time, uh, I think we need the moment of the Ubuntu time that you know even the people who are very happy with command line com and they're very proud of that appreciate that maybe the general user wants other things uh, the sort of like uh, like convenient like uh, similarity ease of use so be able to do what the community really need and be a bit more flexible and reduce a bit like from the idealism I mean the five percent uh, progressives we already have with us, the question is that how are you going to get the next 20% and the next 60% after that? Mm. Thank you, Sally. Sorry? Yeah, yeah. Um, just, you know, following up on, on Sally, like, it's to get in institutional involvement, just um, two, two points. First, at, you know, getting institutions to pay attention for those who have not already, you know, jumped on board with OPEN. A lot of it is finances. It's really showing them how much money they can save because, again, Unfortunately, education is a business um, in many ways, and in, you know, institutions. Like whenever we think about a liberal arts education or a university, it's a it's a business um, fundamentally. And so, if you look at something like open publishing and open educational resources, the pitch that is made to administration, in in my experience, always starts out with, "How much money are you going to save your students by providing open textbooks?" That's not what I'm interested in as a researcher. I'm interested in uh, you know, students being able to participate in the knowledge creation process and author their own educational process. But it's the sell to institutions is the money you're gonna save. So far as, you know, on a, a practical level of how to incorporate um, a focus on open hardware, um, I've, you know, I've been a part of building classes around that conceptually and focusing on more of like a, like that problem-based learning, experiential learning, um, for the student experience, build build a course around it. You know, I was looking at the Open Flexure microscope as an example, putting together um, a user journey um, for testing some tooling, and was thinking about this. And you know, there is such a great opportunity for institutions to serve at. You know, they have the labs test. You know, kick the tires on some of these designs. Partner with a course, partner with a program, and have a, a unit within a course have students try to replicate what you're trying to do, do the UX testing for you, give that information back. It give the, gives the students the experience of learning about what open hardware is. They're doing very practical testing for you and you can connect, you know, do an interdisciplinary connection between some of these engineering labs and technical documentation um, courses to be able to bring back really valuable content that, that can then be infused in the community and make it that kind of, um, you know, self-sustaining ecosystem. 
Absolutely, I think education, well, that's what we're trying now to do with Open Hour Makers together, like a, a university curriculum, absolutely. Uh, also, um, one, one mini comment, um, because I totally agree with education as a business, especially as you're talking from the US, which, which makes absolute sense, but in, in other parts of the world, also the mission, the mission of university, I think uh, Open Hardware can speak to that in terms of democratizing and access. So I think it's, it's both, it has strengths in, in both, ang both angles, Sally. Yeah, and maybe I can add also that also it's called CUD. Uh, I would like to remind of the, the NASA course uh, transfer to open science, which unfortunately does not have open hardware as one of the pillars. So if people here on the education and open hardware, I would really recommend that you get involved in that program. I mean, how cool it is that you can actually develop things for NASA and use this opportunity to actually make education materials standard with a very, very wide reach of uh, institutional support. Thank you, Sally. Frank, do you want to, to make carry on? Yeah, I think our institution is um, supporting um, makers is also very important, especially people working on their community driven projects that will impact their community or help solve local problems. Here in Africa, we don't have we don't have the luxury that most European countries do. So everything unfortunately comes down to to fund them, unfortunately. So I think um, one, um, I'm very strong at the funding part because I think one of the major reasons why um, open hardware and open science has been really popular in Africa is, uh, is down to funding. So if institutions are able to, universities and are able to dedicate a, a percentage of uh, budget to students who are working on uh, and community-driven projects or developing community projects, I think that would also be a way of uh, promoting open uh, hardware. Thanks, Frank. Kirian, if you want to add anything? Yeah, I, I think I, what I would add is uh, one of the major ones, uh, if you want this to happen in a university, is postdocs should probably have some time for it. Um, at the minute, uh, there is usually, depending on the funding body, some time put aside for career development, but that includes like just everything, any side project you might want to have, if you've got consulting work, that kind of thing. Um, so, you know, if, if, if postdocs are going to share their work um, as an open hardware project and actually have the time to document it properly so that it can usually be taken up by other people, that's something that they need to have time to do. Um, it's also something that I think the more senior academics need to understand so that it can actually be recognized from people. Because um, obviously in their career path, it would have been either it stays in academia, it gets you a publication, or you patent it, or you go into a business kind of thing. It's not something that um, you know your supervisor or someone like that might actually be familiar with. So um, a little bit of uh, helping it actually be recognized what it is, what is happening, why it's good to do, um, so that if people do do it, it's something that can actually be seen as an output, um, whereas the minute it might just be like, oh, no, don't do that. <laughs> you know, it's, that's a waste of your time. Might can I fine. react to that uh, quickly? Yeah. Yes. Very so, I mean, here on the issue of postdoc, you should also remember that it's also sharing with the world, it's also sharing with your future self when you are not working at university. And, uh, you know, license is about implicit. So, if you do not put a license, and we have a lot of documentation without a license, which by definition becomes university owned, just putting a license, and it's really, really, I'm reading, put, putting those few uh, words behind, below your documentation, which at the time that you're doing, doesn't really raise any eyebrows or any opposition can help a lot. So just learn about Creative Commons uh, and do that uh, as a service and, yourself. And open hardware licenses, right? Absolutely, yeah. Um, Anne is going to kill me, uh, but I'm, uh, I'm going to give 30, sec 30 seconds to Sarah. Thank you. <laughs> um, and also just following up on that, um, educating folks about alt metrics and um, and how to, to take a look at like what your impact factor is outside of the traditional tenure and promotion system, because that's where it all comes back to policy. That's, you know, you're beholden as a postdoc, you're beholden as a faculty member to follow this prescriptive algorithm that is in the policy of the accrediting bodies for these institutions. And so that's where you need your friends in legal and policy analysis to get in there and change the blueprint of the institution. And before moving on to Anne, I'm going to say that 
NASA unfortunately doesn't have open hardware in, in the in the TOPS um, program, but UNESCO has included open hardware in the open science recommendation from 2021. And that's a huge milestone and, and something we can all uh, get behind. And I am uh, totally here to, and, and the Gathering for Open Science Hardware community is also here to help everyone who wants to start adopting open hardware within open science programs. So now, and <laughs> all yours. Thank you all so, so much. I know we just hit the top of the hour. Um, I will say that this definitely has made me think that this time that we have is just too far too short to address everything that we wanted to talk about. And I feel like um, it does so much tie to the to kind of connect back to the title of the talk, which was connecting open hardware to open science, you know, the NASA TOPS program, the UNESCO call for best practices, all of these things speak to the increasing institutionalization of open open science practices and for open hardware to be a part of that movement to make sure that all of these all of these different practices and all of these different works and all of these different incentives um, enable that process. So with that in mind, I will um, be closing off or turning off the recording. Um, but and thank you so much for everyone for rejoining. Uh, if you'd like to suggest another topic for a future fireside chat, write them in the pad, uh, get in touch with me um, through Slack, through email um, and a message here. If you want to co-sponsor the next fireside chat with us, um, uh, that's even better, please let us know. Um, this event was co-sponsored uh, by Open Hardware Makers. Thank you so, so much, Huli, um, for gathering all this wonderful group of people together um, to speak about so many different parts and elements uh, related to open hardware. I've definitely learned a lot today. Um, it was also very much uh, co-developed through conversations with all of the speakers that are with us today. Thank you so much for your time um, and also for your experience and your expertise. Um, I will turn off the recording here um, and as we said at the beginning of the call, we will leave it open for open Q&A. If anyone have, has any questions or like to bring anything to the fore, thanks again so much for joining us and I'm gonna turn it off.